Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. In this video, I am going to be talking about the Belt of Truth, <laughs> which apparently is a thing. It sounds like something that might be crafted by the elves in Lord of the Rings. But in fact, it's the title of a morning worship video that recently appeared, as in in the last few days, appeared on JW.org. It's presented by Governing Body member Jeffrey W. Jackson. Keep the belt of truth tight. <laughs> I'm sure Jeffrey Jackson knows an awful lot about tight belts. Sorry, I just had to say that. But yes, it's a morning worship video that I've watched and I had a few thoughts on. So without further ado, Let's roll the first clip. This morning we're going to discuss the thought of keeping the belt of truth tight around our waists. Now why is that so important? Well, we see in the world today there's just no end to the misinformation, the lies, uh, the falsehoods that are being spread. But in addition to that, as Jehovah's people, we face all sorts of verbal attacks, don't we? people accusing us of horrific things. And this can be very discouraging. So that's why we need to make sure that we've got the belt of truth firmly around our waist, tight. But how can we tighten it? Well, of course, there are many different ways that we can reassure ourselves of the truth. But this morning, I thought we might talk about just one thing that may help us. And that is to go back to the basics from time to time, to think about this question, what was it that convinced me or my family that this is the truth? And if we meditate on that, it can help to strengthen our resolve to continue in the truth. And in this way, figuratively speaking, it's as if we tighten the belt. And we all know, those of us that wear belts, you need a tight belt for it to be effective. Yes, tight belts are always more effective than belts that aren't tight. Thank you for that reminder, Jeffrey Jackson. And yes, what an interesting concept or mental image. I'm not really sure why we need to fixate on belts per se. I think it's another good example of where Jehovah's Witnesses talk in illustrations and lean on illustrations as being proof for their beliefs, when really an illustration is just something, it's basically word images that are intended to help you get your point across. And I'm going to give you an example of that very soon. But he mentions there that there are all sorts of ways that we could reassure ourselves that we have the truth, I think there's one way that works perfectly every time, and that's to undergo a systematic, objective study and investigation of your beliefs, including what the criticisms are. That's surely the best way of finding out whether you have, quote-unquote, the truth. Because if you do have the truth it's going to stand up to scrutiny, isn't it? It's going to pass with flying colours any test that you apply, if it's the truth. Which brings me to my win-win uh, scenario. I'll mention it again, just in case someone watching this video hasn't heard it. Doing such an investigation is always a win, because either... You affirm that your beliefs are true. You're able to continue in your faith without there being any conflict whatsoever. On the other hand, if you find out that your beliefs aren't true, you get to save yourself all the time, wasted time of following a belief system that isn't true. Anyway, <laughs> Jeffrey Jackson has an alternative to doing an investigation, a systematic objective investigation of whether your beliefs are true and that's to simply ask yourself 
what was it that drew me to the religion to begin with? I don't really see how that's very helpful or meaningful, especially in the context of religions who deceive people or who hook people in with promises that aren't true or that they can't deliver on. And this brings me to my illustration. <laughs> Again, it's not a statement of fact. It's not a statement of evidence. It's simply my way of explaining why Jeffrey Jackson's reasoning is flawed. It's not intended, as is the case with Jehovah's Witnesses, to provide a slam dunk reason why you should do something or not do something. In any case, here's my illustration. A year or so ago, uh, my family and I went on holiday and we booked a property on Airbnb. On the property listing, it had very flattering photographs, as you often find on Airbnbs. It looked like it was right next to the sea, which it was. And the listing promised private parking. Now, the parking element was crucial because we were traveling with two small children and we couldn't afford to park, you know, a long walk away and then cart all of our things and our two kids to wherever it was that we were staying. So having a parking space was crucial. Anyway, we turned up and guess what? There was no parking space. They literally just put free parking space on the ad, even though they didn't have one. We turned up and the host was in a drunken stupor downstairs so that he couldn't welcome us and show us into the apartment. The apartment was unlocked, so we helped ourselves in and had a look around. And we noticed that even if we were to lock the front door, even if the host were to wake up from his drunken stupor and provide us with a key, there were various points in the property where the windows wouldn't close properly or wouldn't lock so that theoretically people could just come in, which was completely unsatisfactory for a family with two small children. We needed, bare minimum, a secure property. Added to this the parking issue, added to this the fact that the furniture, particularly the child's bed, was all rickety and horrible. It was a very poor apartment and it didn't meet our needs whatsoever and we ended up just leaving because we felt lied to. So this brings me back to Jeffrey Jackson's suggestion of contemplating why you joined to begin with. Well, we booked our property to begin with based on a lie, based on deceptions, based on promises that were not kept. And it's the same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. They make a whole bunch of promises. They write a whole bunch of checks that cannot be cashed. They promise you paradise. They tell you that Armageddon's near and it never quite comes. They promise you love, but the love turns out to be conditional on whether you follow the commands, simply dwelling on all of the lies and all of the deceptions that got you hooked into a cult to begin with doesn't make that cult true. If ever you visit me in my office, you'll notice that I have two things that from time to time I'll look at. One is this publication. Now, when you look at it, you might say the same as my wife did a few days ago, don't you have a better copy of that edition? It's, it's not really looking so good. So why is this in my collection of books in the office? Well, because this is the book, Let God Be True, that my mother started studying in 1956 when she was contacted in the door-to-door -door work. Now, I have a connection to this because at that time I was 18 months old. And as you can see in the front, 
Uh, I had no potential whatsoever of being in the writing department or the art department. But I guess it did prove that at an early age I was interested in books. Anyway, this book is close to my heart because it helped my mother at a time when she faced some opposition. She just started using this book when a minister from the Methodist Church and a missionary came along to her house to try to force her to stop studying with Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh dear, it sounds like Mrs. Jackson had quite the encounter with the local Methodists. I will just pause the story here because, as you might expect, I have this publication in my collection. This is the 1952 edition of Let God Be True. As you can see, my copy is in slightly better nick than Mrs. Jackson's, or the the late Mrs. Jackson's. I, I don't know whether she's still alive, but in any case, better condition. The reason why I say the 1952 edition is because this is actually a second edition. The original version of the book was published in 1946, and it's distinguished by its green cover. Now, I thought it was really interesting the way this book is basically brandished in front of the camera by Jeffrey Jackson. It is a continual source of irritation for me as someone who actually has these books in his collection. The way this organisation disingenuously refers to them while simultaneously making it difficult for Jehovah's Witnesses to do their own research into what these publications actually say. So as we've already established on this channel, most notably my conversation with Ben Ford, who was a Bethelite up until last year, in Bethel, Bethel elders have access in their Watchtower libraries to publications going all the way back to the 19th century. So Jehovah's Witnesses could very easily have all of their literature available no matter how far back it goes. But a deliberate decision has been made by Jeffrey Jackson and his pals no, we don't want Jehovah's Witnesses to be able to read what our publications said past a certain point. And as a result, it's difficult in many cases to know what many of these publications say. In the case of the books, you can go as far back as I think 1970, the Watchtower goes back as far as 1950 on Watchtower Online Library. The Awakes go as far back as 1970. They could, if they wanted, make it so that all of these books are available. I'm going to give you two examples in the Let God Be True book of why they're not going to do that. <laughs> so example number one, Tibor's going to love me for this because <laughs> he's have... He's going to have to fish out the, um, the PDF of this book. Sorry, Tibor. But the first example I want to show you is page 144. Bear in mind, this is a 1952 book. So these words were printed in 1952 and originally in 1946. The climax of the centuries has been reached and the great issue of universal sovereignty is about to be settled once and for all by the kingdom. So awake everyone who wants to live under that righteous government. Put not your trust in the princes of this old world who have set up a worldly international organisation in defiance of God's rightful kingdom rule, I think they're talking about the United Nations there, obey the King, Christ Jesus, and flee while there is still time to the kingdom heights. 
time left is short for the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near time left is short 1952 <laughs> i mean this was published decades ago this was published 70 years ago 70 years of the time left is short. They were peddling exactly the same rhetoric, weren't they? All the way back then. And one more, Tibor will be very grateful that I'm not giving you more examples. <laughs> but page 245, I found this really interesting. Jehovah's Witnesses are not against people who salute or desire to salute the flag of any nation nor do they oppose the desire of any person to serve in the armed forces of any nation, nor do they oppose the efforts of any nation to raise an army by conscripting its manpower. If a citizen wants to salute a flag or to enter the armed forces of any nation, it is his right to do so, and Jehovah's Witnesses regard it as wrong for them to oppose the efforts of such person or to condemn him. They do not attempt to convert the world to a refusal to salute flags or to decline to bear arms. They merely keep their neutrality and their obligations as ambassadors for God's kingdom and they declare their reasons for refusing to break their allegiance to their God and Saviour. Persons not under an agreement to obey him and who do not want to be his witnesses are not urged to take such a stand. Even each one of Jehovah's Witnesses must decide for himself what stand he will take on such issues as he will not be interfered with or coerced by any other witness. Just a tissue of lies. First of all, they're saying, well, we would never dream of converting the world to a refusal to salute flags or to decline to bear arms. Isn't that the whole point of the preaching work? To convert the world to become Jehovah's Witnesses so they can survive Armageddon? And then at the end... It says that it's up to Jehovah's Witnesses to decide for themselves whether they are neutral or not, whether they have Christian neutrality and their personal decision won't be interfered with and they won't be coerced. Well, that's not true because you can be disfellowshipped as a Jehovah's Witness for failing to have Christian neutrality. Interestingly, it was actually in 1952 that they brought in disfellowshipping. And this edition of Let God Be True dates to April of 1952. So which came first, the implementation of disfellowshipping or this particular revision is unclear. But unmistakably, that's a contradiction. On the one hand, saying that Jehovah's Witnesses are free to decide for themselves what they'll do without any interference. And on the other hand, disfellowshipping appears for the first time in 1952. So, in a way, I'm glad that Jeffrey Jackson has introduced this book or brandished it on screen. But again, I find it wholly disingenuous the way governing body members do this without giving Jehovah's Witnesses an opportunity to see for themselves what these publications actually say. Now, what did they do? Well, they berated the witnesses. They said all sorts of falsehoods. And uh, they said everything they could that was negative about Jehovah's Witnesses. Once they left, my mother said that she felt very discouraged and disheartened after being the victim of this verbal abuse. So what did she do? She took her King James Bible and turned it to a scripture that she had just studied in paragraph 5 of this book in the first chapter. 
Maybe you'd like to read it with me if you would. If you have an electronic device, you have an advantage this morning because I'd like you to turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. But uh, you, I'd like you to read it from the King James Version. So Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20. And if you tap on the verse 20, you'll see the King James Version may come up. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now that touched her heart and helped her to make the decision to continue on studying. Now if you're like me, you're probably trying to work out what is the testimony, what's this all about? But if you look at the revised text of the New World Translation in verse 20, it helps us, doesn't it? There it says, Instead, they should inquire of the law and of the written confirmation. When they do not speak according to this word, they have no light. So she realized that these uh, two who had come to visit her did not show her anything from the Scriptures. Rather, they just said what they felt about Jehovah's Witnesses. So that helped her because she realized, as the Let God Be True book says in chapter 1, that everything we believe about God needs to be based on the, the Word of God, the Bible. In other words, written confirmation. So that's the first lesson, the first point that is a good reminder to me personally. No matter what people say about us, no matter what negative comments are made, we can always take comfort in the thought that our beliefs are solidly based on the Bible. Are they, though, Jeffrey Jackson? Are Jehovah's Witness beliefs solidly based on the Bible? I've done a video, if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear, 10 Jehovah's Witness teachings that are unbiblical. If you're watching this video as a Jehovah's Witness and you're thinking to yourself, what's this guy talking about? Of course our beliefs are Bible-based. Of course there are no teachings that we have that are unbiblical. I would urge you to watch this video. I'll give you just a teaser as to some of the beliefs that Jehovah's Witnesses have that are unbiblical. The prohibition of birthdays, that's unbiblical. You can say, oh, whenever it describes birthdays, it does so in a negative way, something terrible happens. Well, that's not condemning birthdays, is it? The culture of not having beards, that's unbiblical. The denunciation of higher education, that's unbiblical. The circumstantial evidence rule that Jehovah's Witness elders use, that's unbiblical. And the 2,520-year Gentile times, that too is unbiblical, as I argue in the video. And there are other examples of Jehovah's Witness teachings that are simply not Bible-based. And yet Jeffrey Jackson is here saying, never mind what people say about us, never mind what criticisms may be leveled at our organisation. And notice he doesn't give any specific examples, which is very interesting. When he mentioned at the beginning of his talk, people saying all sorts of terrible things, he didn't give any specific examples there either, did he? I think that's very deliberate. I think once he mentions examples, once he talks about, for example, the child sexual abuse issue, he knows that he's almost inviting Jehovah's Witnesses to start going down the rabbit hole and seeing what's being said online and in the media on these issues. He doesn't mention examples, and his argument is simply, never mind all that, we can take comfort in knowing that our beliefs are Bible-based. I'm sorry, all you need to do is expose the Jehovah's Witness belief system to a bit of scrutiny on this. And what you find is that, as with most 
Christian denominations. It's not a question of it being Bible-based. It's a question of it being an interpretation of the Bible, one of many interpretations of the Bible. An interpretation of the Bible that says, in the near future, there's going to be a catastrophic Armageddon, following which the earth will be completely populated by Jehovah's Witnesses who observe the authority of Jeffrey Jackson and seven other governing body members. It's just silly, isn't it? And <laughs> it's impossible to get to that specific belief about Armageddon and about Paradise Earth as I argue in the unbiblical video, the Paradise Earth teaching isn't biblical. So <laughs> there's so much about Jehovah's Witness beliefs that simply aren't based on the Bible, but even beliefs that are sort of originating from the Bible. So what? There are any number of other denominations and other branches of Christianity who can say exactly the same thing. There is nothing unique about Jehovah's Witness teachings that makes this religion uniquely true. Now, the second thing that you may notice in my office is this Watchtower magazine. It's from February 15, 1955. So if I'm not in my office and you see it, you may think, ah, he's got that there because he was born just a, a couple of weeks after this. No, that's not the reason it's there. The reason is that this was the second thing that helped my mother to take a stand for the truth. There were two beautiful articles in this watchtower. Uh, the first one was entitled, Only One Right Religion. And notice how it starts off. If you pay for wheat, will you settle for straw? If you buy wine, will you accept water? Or if you thirst for water, will you be satisfied with mud? What if someone came to prove that you were being defrauded in these ways? Would you be angry with him or with the one who was cheating you? What a great start to the article. And then it went on to show how the truth of God's word is being taught by Jehovah's people today. What a brilliant illustration and how ironic because that's exactly how it is with apostates if you think about it. Jehovah's Witnesses come along and they promise so much. They promise you a love that never fails, only it fails instantly the moment you start questioning things. They promise you a paradise earth and an imminent Armageddon. In fact, they've been promising it for decades. It never happens. And apostates, quote-unquote like me, turn up and point these things out, point out how people are being lied to and manipulated, including with some incredibly coercive propaganda and tried and trusted means of manipulation that are used by other groups. And instead of being welcomed with open arms, in many cases, Jehovah's Witnesses react angrily and with a great deal of disdain for our message. I'm continually surprised by the number of comments I get on this channel by Jehovah's Witnesses who shouldn't be watching my videos, but somehow they still end up finding their way to the Lloyd Evans channel. And some of the comments are actually quite funny because people are genuinely angry that I'm saying these things. But all they're doing is shooting the messenger. You know, the facts are the facts. And when I make my videos, I feel I go to quite some lengths to support what I'm saying with the organization's own literature or with the Bible, depending on the argument. 
So thank you, Jeffrey Jackson. That is a very apt and ironic illustration. Now, the second article in this magazine, which is equally good, helps persons to see the need to select the true religion. It says, choosing the one right religion. In this article, it raises the point that sometimes people will say, well, I just don't have time to investigate all the religions in the world. How can I find the truth? It's just like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Well, this magazine, building on what was said in Jeremiah, said, well, if you go to a haystack looking for a needle, you don't have to look at every straw in the haystack. Actually, they recommend quite a radical move. Burn the haystack, and then with a magnet, you can find the needle. Now, what's the point? Well, as it goes on to say, you see, as Jeremiah said, God's word is like a fire. You see, in verse 29, it says a fire that consumes the rubbish. So we don't have to go around investigating all the various teachings of different religions. That would be like a huge haystack. But rather, when we study the Bible and we see the pure truth in the scriptures, then we can identify anything that's virtually rubbish or straw, and we have the real thing. Yes, that helps to really convince us that we have the truth. Because if people don't even know Jehovah's name, why would we believe them? And if they believe that uh, people are going to hellfire, why would we believe everything that they say, particularly if they're criticizing Jehovah's people? We're nearing the end of Jeffrey Jackson's Belt of Truth talk. And I found this particular part really interesting because it touches on one of my main issues with religion in general. And that is that there are clearly so many of them and the deciding factor for many people when it comes to what they believe tends to be geography, doesn't it? So if you're born in India, you're more likely to be a Hindu or a Muslim Whereas if you're born in America, particularly the Bible Belt, um, you're more likely to be a Christian, aren't you? So really it's all very much a lottery of birth. And I realise there will always be exceptions. There will be people born into Christian families in India and there will be people born into Hindu or Muslim families in America the point is, religion is self-evidently geographical. And there are so many religions with contradictory claims or contradictory theologies. The only honest way of saying, I have arrived at the one true religion, is to investigate each and every religion and following a thorough investigation, come up with reasons why each and every religion is either true or untrue. And self-evidently, they can't all be true. Really, there can only be one true religion, can't there? They can't all be true. So you'd need to do this properly, wouldn't you? You'd need to do an honest and thorough investigation, in my opinion, in order to say categorically, my religion is true. Otherwise, all you're doing is just trusting that just by divine providence, just by the look of the draw you happen to have been born into the correct religion. You're special. You've been born in the right country or the right culture or the right family. God wanted you to be in his one and only true religion, which is the thinking that I had when I was a Jehovah's Witness. It's manifestly flawed. And Jeffrey Jackson's thought-stopping answer to this whole issue is just trust us. Just trust us that we have the one and only true religion. Presuppose 
the Bible to be the sacred text that's worth reading, the sacred text that is actually the Word of God. Ignore all of the other sacred texts. Ignore all of the other documents that claim to be of divine origin and trust that the Bible is of divine origin and furthermore presuppose that Jehovah's Witnesses have the one and only correct interpretation of the Bible. I'm sorry, presupposition gets you nowhere if you are truly interested in arriving at truth. So what about you? What was it that convinced you that you found the truth? Well, it's good from time to time to think about that question. In my case, I think of those things that my mother taught me. The first one from the book of Isaiah, to make sure that what we believe is based on the Bible. And then the second thing, we don't have to investigate every story that's told to us. Once we have the truth from the Bible, we can recognize what's right and what's wrong. Yes, we don't need to listen to the father of the lie, but we certainly believe in the God of truth. We don't need to investigate. We don't need to listen. We can just put our hands over our ears and go la 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 and just assume that we've got it right. Once a Jehovah's Witness, always a Jehovah's Witness. Remind yourself of the reasons why you became a Jehovah's Witness and try not to dwell on the glaringly obvious, namely, that you were hoodwinked, that you were hooked with promises that have not been delivered on and never will be delivered on. So I found Jeffrey Jackson's Belt of Truth talk. <laughs> Sorry, that mental image um, just cracks me up. But I found his Belt of Truth talk fascinating. So I couldn't help but jump on and do a rebuttal. I'm interested to know what you all think in the comments below. Please feel free to share your thoughts. But I hope you found my thoughts to be of some use. Don't forget that you can watch similar videos to this by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But for now, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for watching.